Uh, Matt Gorry, DP, DOP, cinematographer, cameraman. For me, director of photography, big, bigger crew, cinematographer, sort of one man. I guess you can interchange them a bit, but yeah. Didn't take the traditional route, so um, a while ago now, gee, last century, uh, I was actually working at a small production facility and I was sort of a jack of all trades, so I was doing some producing, directing, writing and uh, shooting as well. And uh, when I left there, I s decided to concentrate on camera work, but um, I didn't really have the lighting skills or the, the knowledge uh, to go and do commercials and things like that. So I just, I went into um, lifestyle and ENG sort of camera work because I had the most experience with that sort of thing. Um, and then after a while, I thought, no, I'd like to, you know, shift across to, to try and do some, some more in-depth lighting work, let's say, and uh, stuff like that. So I actually just started assisting and like in, in various departments, uh, electrics and grip. Um, I'll probably say I wasn't very good at any of those because I spent too much time asking questions and looking. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't have hired me. Um, but yeah, so I did that for a couple of years, which probably isn't very long in the scheme of things in terms of how long some people take. Um, and then just, yeah, got a break shooting a couple of small commercials and went from there. The first, I'd say the first year was really hard work and really it's quite sort of scary because you don't really know what you're doing. Yeah, I don't think you ever really 100% know what you're doing. I've learned that now. But a bit more relaxed about that um, in the beginning. It was pretty nerve wracking. But uh, yeah, the best way is to learn on the job, definitely. Yeah, definitely learn more from doing things or trying to do things and making mistakes. Yeah, you just got to <laughs> not make too many in the one shoot. Yeah. I think you should definitely look at the type of camera you're using on a job by job basis. Um, and I know it's a bit, you know, a lot of people just go, oh, let's just use Alexa. But there's probably a reason for that because out of the box, it just looks, the, from my experience anyway, it just looks the best out of the box. And um, you can put it in some pretty demanding sort of, you know, scenarios and it just always seems to work. And even I'd say switching from, you know, just shooting ProRes, Log C to shooting RAW, um, yeah, you don't have to change anything you do with exposure or anything like that. You know, you've got everything stays the same uh, as opposed to some other cameras where, you know, if you, if you start to do something new or different or if they upgrade the firmware, you know, everything changes, the boundaries change. You've got to relearn everything. So that can be a bit of a challenge. It just seems easier with the Alexa. And it's got a good dynamic range. And the skin, skin tones just look right. So, you know... If you want to, if you know something is just going to look good, you just, and you've got the budget, go for the Alexa probably. But uh, I'd say then next step down, then you've got to really start thinking about, oh, what is the most important thing to this job? You know, do I need, is it low light? Is it high speed? Um, is it the codec if you're recording on board? Yeah, that sort of thing. And then you've got, then further down from that, it's the lenses. Is it like, do you use, are you using photographic lenses? Is that going to be okay? Or do you need to use like, you know, PL mount lenses with, you know, proper focus marks, and barrels, all that sort of thing. So I think, yeah, job, job by job basis. But if you've got the budget, you always, always go for, you know, an Alexa or a Epic or something like that. But usually it's not just the DOP that makes the, well, and mostly it's actually not the, the DOP that makes the call on the camera. You know, it could be someone else, the producer or, the production company, um, particularly if the cameras are, you know, quite cheap to buy, you'll often find um, production companies will buy their own camera. So then you just sort of, they'll want you to use their camera, um, which can be, you know, a challenge if it's not, if it may not be the right tool for the job, uh, but then you're sort of locked in because they need to use that camera because it's theirs. That's so, yeah, I mean, in that way, it's not so good. And obviously, you know, you get what you pay for to a certain extent. So there's definitely, there's definitely pitfalls to those cheaper cameras. 
whether or not anyone else can see them, apart from, you know, people who work with them, I don't know. Well, camera does matter to some extent, but um, it's not the most important thing there. Yeah, and it's certainly, if you've got a good camera and the talent is really bad or the lighting is bad or the direction is bad, you know, it's not gonna help. It doesn't matter. You need everything. I can't remember who said this once, but there's lots of, apparent, you know, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of feature films made every year and you only see, you know, a tenth of them, if that. And the ones that you see are the ones where every little part has gone right. And in so many things, you know, one part just didn't work, wasn't right. But, and it's no good, you'll never see it. So, camera's definitely not the be all and end all. Uh, it's just one part of the equation, but yeah. I don't know, for me, um, usually I like to, a good shot for me is something that's, the lighting is completely hidden and you don't know. I'm just basically making something that's possibly real, you know, hyper real, maybe better than what it is. So, uh, especially for what the camera can see. So you go into a space and you're basically just making it look the best it can look, but you're not doing anything that's false or unnatural, so to speak. You, I guess you call it sort of naturalistic lighting, which can still be quite a bit of lighting, but <laughs> some people think, oh, naturalistic lighting means no lighting or one light or something like that. Well, maybe it is, but usually it yeah, requires a fair bit of work. But yeah, I like that sort of style, unobtrusive. Ah, uh, all sorts of things, all sorts of things. It can be sometimes even, Crazily enough, it, it might not even be visual. You know, there's obviously, um, you know, photographers, painters, um, definitely DOPs, uh, films, but yeah, directors as well, but sometimes, you know, music even. Anything that's sort of, oh, that's flickering. Anything that um, sort of piques your imagination gets, you know, the juices flowing. Definitely is flickering. <laughs> yeah, inspiration, definitely like, real life as well, just things you see out in the street or out in nature, mother nature. Uh, it can come from many places. I don't think you should just have it come from one place. If you just have it come from films or from you know one DOP, that can be pretty dangerous because who are you then? You're just a mirror image of that one thing. That's a bit boring. I think you need to be an amalgamation of a whole lot of things. If I'm lucky, I get to get to the get to see the location beforehand, take some photos and stuff. That's the best way, obviously, because then you can really get your head around the space uh, and 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 also get any inspiration from you know natural things, lighting and stuff that's happening already. Um, and then you may have another couple of meetings, get the storyboards, and then I'll probably just normally for like small commercials and music videos, really, unless it's a super detailed rig uh, and if it's only like one day I'll normally just write some notes on the storyboards um, in terms of rough lighting instruments and you know rough directions uh, and then I might you know chuck the lens in that I think I'm going to use and stuff like that and, and any camera movement uh, but that's as far as I go I don't really do full-on blocking diagrams or anything like that if it's a longer form thing you know a few days or it's going to be something where I can't really think a lot about it the day before, then I'd probably plot it out a bit more. But yeah, generally for the stuff I do, just handwritten notes. That way no one else can read them and know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like the doctor's prescription. I mean, with the size of the most, of the most of the productions I do, it's not, they're not the massive commercial, so we're not, we rarely run large generators and 18Ks and stuff. Like we, sometimes you just, you have to go there, so you need to use them. But most of the stuff, uh, it's just smaller, so 4K and down. So we can usually, you know, either just run off, purely off house power or just have a couple of small jennies out the back and house power, um, depending on what the location is. So yeah, 4Ks, two and a halves. 1.8, those M18s, the, the Aries sort of new PARs, they're really good. Um, what I have noticed with some of the cameras, the Alexa's not too bad, but some of the Sonys, for example, and even the Reds are pretty 
sensitive to mixing different lights. So for example, mi even mixing um, HMIs and, and say Kinos, Fluoros, you can, you can really see the difference, or I can see the difference anyway. So, and it's sometimes hard to just get that mix of, you know, if you have to add just that little bit, like one eighth magenta or, or, or green, depending on which one you're adding it to. But yeah, so now more often I'll try if I can and just stick to, you know, one type of instrument, so either all HMI or all Kino and tungsten, or all tungsten. But yeah, sometimes you need to do a bit of both. Or LED, you know, you got LEDs as well now as well, but they're a mixed bag. So unless you've got the really expensive ones, they can be a bit of a trick as well. Especially as soon as you start adding gels to them, they do, they don't react in the way that you expect them to. Well, in the beginning, watching other people, not doing my job properly, probably. Um, and from there, probably just reading, I've read a lot. You know, it's always good to read things like American Cinematographer Magazine, stuff like that. Um, and then at the time, probably did a lot of, it's quite a few years ago, did a lot of like short films and stuff like that. So I could just, the sort of things where there was less pressure to get it right because, you know, no one was being paid, so you could sort of make mistakes. And I guess it was, you know, my own version of film school. So you could make a mistake, you wouldn't lose your job. Um, whereas you can't really afford to do that sort of thing on commercials, obviously. You're just going to get in there, get it right, get it done. So, yeah, I think, yeah, you've got to know the time and the place. So, it's, yeah, it's, that's why it's good to do things like commercials and sort of no-budget things. So you can do, uh, not commercials, short films. So you can, um, you know experiment with ideas that you might have had and not have to suffer the repercussions if it doesn't work. A raft of music videos, which is a bit different for me because I usually just do commercials, but for some reason you just become flavor of the month, I guess, and then <laughs> all of a sudden you're the music video guy. Well, actually, funnily enough, the ones I've been doing have been very similar production-wise to the sort of commercials I do, except um, you're trying to, if it's a one day shoot, you're trying to squeeze, you know, three or four minutes worth of content into uh, one day instead of 30 seconds. So, and usually the ideas are a lot more out there. So yeah, it can be challenging. It's definitely a different mindset. What we did with that was basically we wanted, obviously you want your, we wanted the talent to, to be lit with a neutral light, a white light, but then we wanted the shadows to, to come up with all the primary colours and then secondary colours as well in the, in the in-between shadows. So what we did is we set up a bank of three lights and we basically did an RGB gel spectrum over them. So each light, one light red, one light blue, one light green. Mix them together and just uh, on, the, on the dimmer board we just set the levels and with my colour temperature meter we just basically got it until we read, you know, 100% uh, proper 3200 tungsten. And it, it turned out pretty well, that one, I think. It was, it was pretty interesting. I think, um, is it Bob Elms, the DP, did he shot one of the Hulk films? He used to like doing that sort of stuff. So it was kind of interesting. Kind of reminded me of something Andy Warhol might do. So yeah, that was cool. We did some, we were in the studio for that one, then we were outside at the end of the night. We were shooting on an Alexa XT, so we shot um, Ari Raw and, um, so black magic camera as well, which um, I believe that that was the director's camera, and he said he had a hard time. It was a bit uh, trying to soften the image up a bit. So the black camera was black magic camera was a bit uh, sharp. Reese Maston's latest video, um, which was a kind of Wes Anderson style thing, uh, that was shot in the Alexa as well. That's up girls all around the world. So originally we were going to go, yes, let's fully Wes Anderson this and only shoot on one lens, like uh, I think it was going to be a 28 or a 35 mil. But um, sure enough, as soon as we got into the day, you know, things started as they do, not quite going to plan. And it's like, oh, you know, this is going to take a long time if we just stay on this lens. So we had a really short zoom as well, luckily. And um, we actually ended up using that for most of the, the clip. But we stayed in a range that still had 
it still felt like it was in that, you know, basically I wanted to, wanted it to feel like it was one lens, but um, we were able to, you know, just change the focal distance a bit if we needed to really quickly reframe. So that worked pretty well, I think. But it was all nice static frames and yeah. The first part was on the beach and it was a super, super windy day. So that was really difficult. We luckily again, so that was Alexa, which is, very lucky because the contrast ratio was a bit of a kill and we couldn't use large overheads like 12 foot well i wanted to use originally we were going to use like a 12 foot overhead and 12 foot bounce but it was just too windy for that and the crew was too small so we uh, ended up just using some poly for some fill and then for some of the close-ups we had a i think it was a six by six frame up and even that was looking like it was going to snap um, but yeah that like the alexa was like yeah whatever no problem no, so the six by six was an, an overhead, just diffusion. Yeah, it's quarter silk, just to just to take the edge off the sun as a backlight. And uh, I didn't turn my phone off. Sorry. And uh, yeah, just just poly really as fill, and that was all we used there. That's all we could get away with, uh, which was in a hall, and that was just we were really against it time wise then, so we lit it super quick with a couple of, I think they were a couple of 1.8s, M18s, and uh, just through heavy frames. And uh, that was about it. Maybe a 400 watt pocket par as a backlight. Yeah, all the ones I've done um, recently have been, oh, no, I lied, I've done one that was two days. Um, and that's, shot that a couple of months ago, but that's still in post, because that's really, that was a really heavy, um, VFX intensive one. So I don't know if you saw any of the behind the scenes one. There was a Jezebel clip. We had um, a Steadicam AR as well, Peep Arter. So that was really cool, you know, on the arm, Steadicam on the arm, rotating around in a tunnel. And um, there's going to be CG of this uh, graffiti snake that's going to be coming around and following the, the camera around. That's going to look amazing. Uh, what's new for a, I think it was a steam iron? Sunbeam, that's, I think that's out there somewhere. That was Alexa as well. Um, again, a day, like most of the things I do are just, yeah, one day, one day shoots, so for a 30 second TVC. Um, uh, okay, that was all interiors, uh, pretty much one location in uh, a lounge room. Um, for this one, it's important to make the presenter look good, so we just, uh, but still keep a bit of contrast. So we we made the lighting as soft as possible. And this was a kind of book light sort of thing. So it was a HMI bounced into some griff from memory, and then that was so that was then bounced through uh, a diffusion frame. So doof, doof, super soft. So you get to keep a bit of contrast still, but it's really, really wrapping around soft light. So it still wraps most of the way around so that they look very nice. We had a background lights for um, just, you know, get, putting a bit of a bit of a look, bit of contrast into the, the back where the wall is and everything. And uh, had a backlight too, I think, soft backlight, which again would have been, I think it was a 400 or 575, probably bounced. Yeah, but that was about it, so not much. And that's a whole lounge room scenario. But yeah, so I definitely use less lights than I used to as well, which is important, I think. Because you, you end up, you end up lighting yourself into corners. I find the more lights you pull out, it can get really complicated sometimes, and then you just, it's hard to find a way out. Whereas if you just try and simplify it as much as possible but keep it looking natural then it's a lot easier to change things around and if things don't work it's just it's just an easier headspace but it's you can't i don't know you have to go through the complicated route to get to the simplistic route i think well the jezebel one is going to be out in a couple of weeks probably so that was pretty interesting that was um the first day we shot in a tunnel um that was with the steadicam ar rig uh, and it's a lot of motion tracking. So basically we put um, motion tracking marks all up and down around the tunnel and um, the Steadicam moved through the tunnel. It was finding all these points 
and then at the end it reveals the artist. Uh, and then in post, uh, the VFX guys are going to basically match move that and they're going to put in a, uh, a graffiti snake that, that basically develops and is chasing after the camera, so to speak, and then comes around at the end. And then we did a second day of that just uh, on black with the artist. And that was just handheld. It was a small shoot. So because the tunnel was such... It was such a large area and we were moving around so much. Uh, I opted to, and it had, luckily it had um, fluoro strips already in there. So we, I did some tests beforehand and opted to just go with natural light in there. So just the, the fluoro strips that were in there. And then at the end, we just built up some lighting on uh, T-bars for the artist because we obviously, she needed to be lit a bit better than by funky colored fluoro strips. So yeah, just some tungsten lighting for her. Uh, and that was it. And then the second day in the garage was just Kinos from memory. Flathead 80 and a quad bank. Oh, and a couple of Ditos. That was the Flathead was probably around a little bit more sidey. So for a bit more contrast than 45 degrees. And then I had the I think it was a, actually a two foot quad bank close to the camera overhead just to give a bit of front fill. Right, yeah, owning gear. Uh, so I, yeah, I've owned a bit of lighting and, and stuff like that in the past and, and a little bit of camera stuff. Uh, and I've probably actually moved away from that. The sort of the higher end my jobs get um, and the more specialized, I should say, the less obviously that I need to do everything myself so a lot of the time I'm working with gaffers and grips and you know things like that so I don't need any of that gear um, but I think at the beginning well, it depends which way you come up if you come up through the camera assistant route then maybe not so much but um, you know if you're just slogging your way up as a filmmaker or whatever it's good to have your own kit if not if for no other reason then if you do those freebies and things like that then you've got lights that you can play with and you can also just play with them at home and you know mess around with gels and stuff like that because otherwise how are you going to how are you going to learn, learn if you don't have any of the gear you, know, you don't need massive lights to learn that sort of stuff so but in terms of making money from it lights i'd say anything without a microchip in it good better investment because it's going to last longer cameras you've got to be sure that you're going to pay it off, I'd say, in a couple of years because they don't last very long.